you know, we're coming here to uh, meet at the Church of Christ in Sanford, and uh, uh, what, what we do here is just try to be Christians, just like in the first century, to try to restore New Testament Christianity, first century Christianity, and um, swallow the Bible as close as we can. And if you look at the scriptures, it's a very, very scriptural thing to do, um, actually. Um, not try to get tied up in reformations or just try to re restore New Testament Christianity. Um, today, uh, in our announcements, um, um, we had uh, Lisa's family, uh, I guess Lisa's twins family. They had a little uh, scare, but it looks like it's all negative, everything's okay. Um, I guess Bill Harris, um, his wife Christine Harris, I don't know if anybody knows them, I think they're from Fayetteville, and she was killed. Um, <coughs> um, so we want to pray for that family. Um, also, I guess Tori's dad, Tori's father, I'll pray for him. He's going through, a, um, I guess, a health issue. and. Uh, uh, Tom and Sharon Gray also going through a health issue. And please pray for them. Um, um, so would you bow with me in prayer? Our dear Father, um, uh, we, have, we thank you so much for um, this day and um, all the blessings you, you give us, Father. And uh, Father, we, we praise your name and we thank you for uh, this wonderful world you, you gave us and it's truly amazing how you created something out of something uh, something so much infinite universe out of nothing and you gave it all rules um, um, to, to, to go by father um, we praise your name and we acknowledge you and um, we praise your name um, father we ask you blessings on each one here as we worship here today, Father. And um, Father, <coughs> we ask you to help us get through this um, this virus uh, very soon, Father. Um, this is our prayer in Jesus' name. I'd also like to um, um, welcome all, all the visitors um, here today. Morning. Good morning. Scripture reading this morning will come from the book of Colossians, chapter 3. We'll begin reading in verse 8 and read through verse 15. Once again, that's Colossians 3, 8 through 15. I'll be reading from the King James Version of the Scripture. And the scripture reads, But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that did create him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Selenian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another, and any man have quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfect, perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, so that which you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Some 2,000 years ago, 
the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper. On the first Pentecost, AD 33, was the first time that the disciples, as a kingdom of God, remembered the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection by communing with the brethren in the Lord's Supper. It says, upon the first day of the week, the disciples come together to break bread. That is one of the principal reasons why the church assembles each first day of the week to remember what happened those 2,000 years ago. When God's Son came into the world, lived a perfect life, and then offered himself as a perfect sacrifice. On the night he was betrayed, he said to the disciples, he took bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. Shall we pray? Holy Father, we thank thee for the most precious gift of thy son. For the effectiveness it has to allow thee to justly forgive us of our sins. Father, we thank thee for this bread which represents the body of our Lord and Savior that was given on that tree for the sins of the world. As we eat this day, Father, may we remember and reflect back on that great sacrifice and what it means for all of us in our salvation. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. In like manner, the scripture says, Jesus took the cup and gave thanks and said, Drink ye all of it, for this is the blood of the New Testament given for the sins of the world. Shall we pray? Holy Father, we thank thee once again for the death of thy son. Realizing, Father, that that tragedy had to be accomplished in order that we might have forgiveness of sins. We thank thee for this cup, which represents that precious blood, which is able to cleanse all us of our sins. We thank thee very much, Father, for his life and for the willingness on his part to endure such suffering and pain that we might be able to be forgiven of our sins. As we reflect upon those things, Father, may we drink this cup in remembrance of him. In Christ's name, amen. This time we've set aside for the prayer for the offering made each Lord's Day. We have been truly blessed as a nation. We've been blessed as individuals. So many times we take these blessings for granted. The very fact that you're here today is because God allowed it. And so at this time we're going to pray for the offering, should you bow with me, please. Holy Father, we thank thee for thy greatness. Thank thee for thy love and thy mercy. But Father, we also thank thee for all the things that thou hast provided for us, giving us life and breath, providing for us shelter, clothing, food in abundance, providing for us children, loved ones, providing us jobs, opportunities to earn income that we might have to provide these things that thou hast laid up for us. Father, at this time as we prepare to give back a portion of that which 
thou hast given us. For surely, O God, all things are thine. We thank thee very much, and we pray that we will do so with cheerful hearts, that the funds that are collected would be used to further thy work in this community and elsewhere. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Following the service, if you'd like to contribute to the work here, there's a box posted in the foyer in back. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all. Good to be back together. Um, there's a little bit of an echo up here uh, from the sound downstairs. So the way I, I've chosen to look at that is uh, you get double blessing being up here. You get to hear me twice. So if I don't drive it home the first time, whatever point I'm trying to make, you definitely will get it the second time. So some of you may be saying, well, that's not necessarily a blessing to have to hear him twice. But uh, I guess it all depends on perspective. But it is good to see you. It's good to be back. It is such a blessing uh, that God has given to us to be able to meet in this facility. Um, we're glad to, to be able to be back in here. Um, uh, I know it's uh, a little bit uncomfortable, uh, but... Uh, but as time goes, hopefully we'll, we'll adapt. Hopefully, not too long away, we will be able to uh, rid ourselves of the mask. I don't know when that'll happen, but hopefully soon. Uh, but until it does, I'm just thankful to be with our church family. This morning, I want to take a few minutes, and I want to begin looking at Colossians chapter 3. I appreciate so much uh, Jody reading that passage for us. I uh, want to spend just a few minutes there to kind of kickstart off what we want to say today. Um, in Colossians chapter 3, Paul, writing to the good brethren there, um, reminds them that as a child of God, I have died to something and I have been reborn to something new. I am, in essence, a new creature, a new man in Christ. Um, he starts off the chapter in verse number one by saying, If then, if then, uh, you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Why? Where Christ is seated, because that's where Christ is, at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things uh, below, uh, or things that are on the earth. Put on the new man. And he then goes on to begin to look at uh, a comparison of what we were and what we are to be now. Uh, he says in verse 5, he says, put to death, or in other words, stop doing what you used to do. Put them to death. Did that old man die in the water? Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. That is a lot harder to do than it is to make the statement, isn't it? We are all struggling to put that old man to death because sometimes he likes to pop up every now and then, or that woman, and, and make me act in a way I don't want to. And he goes through a list of things that, that, that we are to put to death in, in our uh, new life. We are to put to death sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. All those things and many others we could list are to die in us. Those are things that are supposed to be of our past and not of our present. Uh, he says, notice verse 7, In these you too once walked. You once walked like that, but as a Christian, I am trying to live differently than that. Uh, he goes to another list in verse 8. He says, But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk uh, from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you um, have put off the old self with its practices. And so he goes to that whole list there of saying, those are things you once were, but you don't need to be that anymore. He says something similar 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, he goes to verses 9 and 10 to a long list, a laundry list of things that, that, that the Corinthian brethren used to be. But you notice he uses the past tense. These are things you used to be. These were, were what you used to be, but they're not anymore. You were washed, you were cleansed, you were sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so as a child of God, I am in a constant battle with myself to put those things away. And it is a battle, and it is a war that we fight even against our own desire. And then in verse 12, he, he changes tone and he focuses on what we are to become or are to be. He says, put on then as God's chosen, holy and beloved, or chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also do, or so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. And so he gives a list of things that you and I as Christians uh, are to become or are to uh, show in our lives. It's a very similar list to what you'll find in uh, Galatians chapter 5, and he talks about the fruit to the Spirit. Those are things that as a Christian should flow out from us. Uh, we should be people of, of love and showing that love to one another. We should be people of kindness, of gentleness, of meekness or humbleness, of self-control. How am I doing in that journey? How are you doing? How are you doing in becoming what God wants you to be? How am I doing in fighting that battle? If you're like me, there are days when I feel good about my walk with God, and there are days when I feel like I am really struggling. To me, that's the Christian walk, isn't it? This morning... I want to spend a little bit of time talking about these battles we fight. These battles we fight even amongst one another and with ourselves. What are the characteristics that as a Christian I'm fighting to overcome, that I'm fighting to put off? And what is it that I'm trying to become? I want to deal with just a few of these comparisons this morning. Number one, as I think about my walk with God and my walk with the church, would I be better known as the complainer or the encourager? The complainer or the encourager? In Numbers chapter 14, as Joshua and Caleb and the others the other ten come back from the land of promise. And you know that the children of Israel stand on the precipice of, of finally receiving God's promise of a land that flows with milk and honey. And so these spies are sent into the land to give a report of what the Israelites face. And if you remember, 10 come back and give an evil report, saying we cannot overcome. We are like grasshoppers in their eyes. With only Joshua and Caleb saying, we can win this. We can do this. And I want you to notice what's said in Numbers 14, beginning at verse number 1. Upon hearing the report, the congregation, then all the congregation, raised a loud cry. And the people wept that night, and all the people of Israel grumbled. 
Another term we might throw in there is complained. Against Moses and Aaron, the whole congregation said to them, would that we, we had died in the land of Egypt or would that we had died in the wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become prey. Would it not have been better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Think about the, the impact of that statement. What happened in Egypt? They were slaves. They had no freedoms. They had no promise of, of, of a happy life in Egypt, and yet that's where they're clamoring to go back to. And so they cry out against Moses and Aaron and ultimately to God. This is a group full of complainers, full of grumblers. You notice later in that chapter in verse number 11 and 12, God's response to their complaining and grumbling. God said, the Lord said to Moses, how long would this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me? In spite of all the signs that I have done among them, and they were many, go back to the to the days leading up to their release from Egypt and all that God did, turning water to blood, you think of the frogs, the gnats, the boils, all those plagues that God brought. And then how he brought them out and took them across some dry land to the Red Sea, how he fed them from heaven with manna, and yet here are all these people still grumbling and complaining. He goes on in verse number 12. He says, I will strike them with pestilence and disinherit them. And I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. There's another time when God will say to Moses, I can bring people from this rock for you. God is does not like grumbling and complaining. You notice in Proverbs chapter 6, beginning at verse 16, Proverbs 6 and verse 16, there are six things God hates and seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies. And notice this last one. And one who sows discord among brothers. A complainer. A grumbler. What am I sowing? among my brothers and sisters. Discord? Complaining? Or am I one who is an encourager? In Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse number 14, Philippians 2 and verse 14, Paul writes to the Philippian brethren, do all things without grumbling, or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Paul says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Where do you find yourself? Are you a complainer, a grumbler? Or do you find yourself more in the place of a man named Joseph? 
we better know him as Barnabas. In Acts chapter 4, in a discussion that Luke has, Acts chapter 4, about how the church was giving to one another, how they were selling their own property, bringing the proceeds from that, laying it at the apostles' feet, we are introduced to a man we know as Barnabas. You notice there, verse number 30, uh, sorry, verse number yeah, 36, Acts 4, 36, then uh, thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, now notice this, which means son of encouragement. Names in the, in the word of God, especially when, when they're changed by God, are significant. A lot of biblical individuals, those who are written about, have had name changes. Barnabas was one of those. It says he was changed because he was the son of encouragement. He was among those who was selling his own property and providing that money not to his own needs, but to the needs of the church. What a powerful example of an individual who was not a complainer, was not one to sow discord among his brothers and sisters, but one who sought to encourage, to lift up, to build up the body of Christ. In my life, am I building up or am I tearing down? Go to the book of Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians four, verse number 29, Paul, in writing about this same kind of idea, he says, Ephesians 4, verse 29, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So in other words, when, when you and I are grumbling and complaining and tearing down, we are grieving the Holy Spirit of God. Next time you and I have an opportunity and feel the temptation to grumble and complain, let's remember what we're doing when we do that. Paul says we're grieving the Holy Spirit. Do you want to be caught grieving the Holy Spirit? I don't. So next time I feel like complaining, I need to remember what I'm doing. Verse 31, let all bitterness, bitterness is a, is a terrible place to find ourselves. Bitterness hardens our hearts. Bitterness makes it easier for us to hate makes it easier for us to tear down those around us. Satan would love nothing more than to turn our hearts bitter. He goes on, he says, uh, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, complaining, and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Remember the attitude and manner with, with which Jesus went to the cross for you. Shouldn't we afford that same kind of attitude toward our brothers and sisters rather than complaining and grumbling against the church, against those whom we have been united together with in Jesus Christ. And also remember this, even if at one time I've been an encourager, it is easy for us sometimes to fall back into that bitterness, into that complaining attitude. Even Barnabas struggled with this. Go to Galatians chapter 2, and I just give this as a warning to all of us 
that any of us could fall back into that old mindset. Galatians 2 and verse number 13, Paul says, in a discussion of Jews trying to force Gentiles to become circumcised, which they had no right to do. And it even got to a point where Peter was disfellowshipping or not fellowshipping with Gentiles because of the influence of other Jews or formerly Jews, now Christians. And Paul writes in verse 13, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, Peter, so that even Barnabas, the son of encouragement, was led astray by their hypocrisy. Any of us are susceptible to that kind of attitude. Paul says, let our speech be seasoned with grace. When I talk about the church, when I talk about my brothers and sisters, when I talk about God, what kind of attitude do I use? Am I a complainer or am I an encourager? Number two, am I a hanger on or am I a worker? In Luke chapter eight, Jesus talks about sowing seed among those who are outside of the church, sowing the gospel in their hearts. And you may remember, there are four different types of soil which the seed falls on. It's the hard packed ground. It's the rocky ground. It's the thorny ground. And then it is the good soil, the good ground. Now we would all in here probably thought, we're the good soil, right? I hope so. You being here this morning is a statement to that truth. However, let us not be too content where we are. Let us truly consider who we are. In verse number 14 of Luke chapter 8, Jesus discusses the seed that fell among thorny soil. Notice what he says. And as for the, what fell among thorns, they are those who hear and believe. And as they go their way, they are choked by the cares of uh, by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. Think about the kind of Christian I am. Am I a fruit bearer? Am I the kind of soil that's going to bear fruit for God? Or am I just a hanger on, just going with the flow and living off the fruit of others? Other people cannot produce the fruit in our own lives. Only we can do that. In John chapter 15, in a discussion of, of, of fruit bearing, Jesus gives the example of vines. And in verse number two, he talks about each branch. He says, every branch, John 15 and verse two, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, what? He takes away. And every branch that does, uh, does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Did you notice that first line there? Every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away. What does he do with that fruit? Go down to verse number eight. Of John 15, he goes on to say, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. How do we prove to be the disciples of, of Jesus Christ? It's by the fruit we bear. Am I bearing fruit in my life? Earlier he mentioned that the fruit, the branches that do not bear fruit are cast into the fire. 
Is it important that I bear fruit in my life, that I don't just hang on? I need to be one who is actually producing something in my life for the kingdom of God. If you go back to Luke chapter 8, he continues his discussion of the soils. Luke chapter 8 and verse 15, one verse later than what we read before. Luke 8 and verse 15, Jesus says, As for that, in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word... Hold it fast with an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. Am I a fruit bearer or am I just showing up? Am I one who actually digs in and does the work? Sometimes I become very nervous that the church has a few really hard workers. And then sometimes we have hangers on. God expects us to bear fruit, not just to hang on. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 39, we read the the events that surround the death of a woman we know as Dorcas or Tabitha. In verse 39, when Peter comes to Joppa where she has passed away, Peter rose and went with them, and when he arrived, he took, uh, they took him to the upper room. Notice what's going on in this area. All the widows stood by, uh, stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. Dorcas was a woman who produced fruit in her life, and you see it by the reaction to her passing. These widows have been touched by this woman, have been affected in a great way by her example, by her work in their lives. Do you think she made a difference? Do you think there was anything produced in her life for good? Sure sounds like it to me. What am I producing in my life? Now, I'm not producing this fruit to be known by others. That's not the reason why we do any of these things, but it's to be seen by God. It's to be, it's to be recognized as a fruit bearer for the kingdom of God. Am I a hanger on or am I a fruit bearer, a worker? And then finally, number three, am I a fence rider or am I dedicated to the work. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 24, Jesus plainly stated that no one can serve two masters. Matthew 6 and verse 24, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money, or some translations have mammon. The ideal there is the world, the world's possessions. You can't both strive for what the world produces and for the, the fruits of God. I can't do both. I can't live on the fence between these two worlds where you try to get the best out of what the world offers and the best out of what God offers. That's just not the way a Christian can live. We cannot ride the fence, and yet sometimes maybe we all find ourselves doing that very thing. God has called us, Jesus has called us out of the world and into the kingdom of his dear son, Paul will tell the Colossians. You've been called out of the dark world. You've been called out uh, 
of, of your former life that's been buried in your baptism. And you've been raised to be a new creature, serving God. There's an example given of a man who tried to live in both worlds. And he ultimately failed. If you go to Philemon chapter 1 and verse 24, I want you to notice a certain name that Paul will give, as he does often in his salutations. He gives uh, names of individuals. And in verse 24 of Philemon chapter 1, Paul mentions Mark, Articus, Demas, and Luke. Notice that name Demas. Notice what he says about them. He says at the end of that text, my fellow workers. How did Paul see Demas at this time as a fellow worker in the kingdom? as one who was striving along with Paul in the cause of the cross. Now, who in here wouldn't love to have a letter with Paul naming us as a fellow worker? Wouldn't that be awesome? Unfortunately, that's not the way the story ends with Demas, at least from a biblical standpoint. You go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 10, as Paul is writing near the end of his life. He writes again about Demas. Notice what he says. Verse number 10 of 2 Timothy 4. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. What a sad, sad statement. But it is something that could happen to any of us. Becoming a child of God does not end temptation. It does not end our fight. It does not end Satan's attacks. He will constantly try to pull us away and he'll use anything in our lives to do that. There was something in the life of Demas where he decided to quit, to give up. Paul says he was in love with this present world. What we love says so much about who we are as people. What we choose to love. We often think about love in reference to whom we love, but that's not always the case, is it? Often, when we talk about love, or at least when we act on it or think about it, it's about what we love. What we're willing to devote our time, effort, and energy to. By the way you spend your time, your money, your effort, what would that say about what really it is in your life that you love? James and James 4 and verse number 4, James writes it this way. James 4 and verse 4, he says, You adulterous people. Adulterer is one who tries to live in two worlds, aren't they? They try to have Two different things that they cannot have. Do you know, uh, you, um, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity or hatred or hostility with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy with God? Am I trying to be a friend of the world? Am I trying to compromise myself, my faith, in order to please the world? Paul, or James, I'm sorry, says, I've made myself an enemy with God. 
In other words, we must choose. You must make a choice. And we cannot refuse that choice. Because by refusing, you've made your choice. We cannot live both in the world and with God. We cannot ride the fence. Let's go to Titus 2 as we end this. Titus chapter 2 and verse number 11. Titus 2, beginning at verse number 11. We read, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people training us to renounce or give up ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age. Man, Demas had just read those letters and took them to heart. Living godly lives in the present age waiting for our blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify himself a people for his own possession. Now notice this, who are zealous, dedicated, eager for good works. One thing that really scares me in my own life and what I see in our world is apathy, indifference. It worries me that as a Christian that I could become an apathetic, indifferent Christian. One who's been lulled to sleep by this world and by the desires of this world. I don't want to ever become indifferent. I don't want to ever become apathetic. I want to be zealous for good works. Are you a zealous Christian? Are you a child of God? Have you put to death the old man that the new man may be born out of that? Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? In Romans chapter 6, Paul says that as a Christian, as one who's obeyed the gospel, we've put that old man to death. And obeying the gospel, when we are buried with Christ in baptism, we are raised to be a new creation in Jesus Christ. Are you in Christ this morning? Are you still fighting the good fight of faith? Are you zealous for good works? For those who may not be a child of God, we want to continue to extend to you an invitation. You can let me know this morning Reach out to me on, on Facebook or, or by text or someone else here. It doesn't have to be me. But if you're not a child of God, you have not obeyed the gospel. I want you to understand what a dangerous position you have placed yourself. Don't allow that to continue. If you need to study the word of God, that's what we're here for. We're willing to do whatever we can to help you better understand what God's will for your life is. Maybe you're a child of God who isn't the encourager that you need to be. Maybe you've been complaining too much. Maybe you've been grumbling. Maybe you need to repent of that. Maybe you're just hanging on and not working as you should, not bearing the fruit you should. Maybe you're trying to ride the fence and you've fallen off. Because we all realize you can't ride the fence. You'll fall off into the world every time. We can help you. Help you restore your relationship with God. 
We're here ready to help in any way that we can. As we close, would you bow with me as we pray together? Almighty God and Father above, thank you so much for your awesome grace, your mercy. Father, for the way you extend to us a warm welcome into the kingdom of God. Father, we're so thankful that we have the opportunity to have our sins washed away, to know that we are saved in Christ. Father, for those here this morning, those who are watching online, Father, we are mindful of them. We, we pray that, that in some way your word will touch their heart, that you'll use us in reaching out to the lost. Father, we pray for those who are struggling in their faith. We all know we do at times. We pray for them as well. We pray, Father, that, that your word will touch their heart as well. Father, we all pray for the zeal that we need to, to be the, the kind of child of God, that your child, that, that, that is zealous, that is eager to commit ourselves to doing those good things for being fruitful for the kingdom. Thank you, Father. Thank you for all these things, but most of all, thank you for Jesus. It's in his name, Mom, for this prayer.